Welcome to Getting APIs to Work. In today's episode, we'll look at how the internet works. We will not look into the details of how it really works, so to speak, under the hoods, but we will understand and we will look at the elements that make it work. And that alone is something that allows us to understand quite a bit of how the internet works without having to go for a deep dive into all of the protocols that we will look at. So we will discuss the most popular layers. We will talk about IP, UDP, TCP, TLS, SSL, and we will understand what these protocols are doing and how they interact to make the internet work. But before we do that, why is the internet called the internet? Is it just a fancy name? And no, it's not just a fancy name. It actually is a meaningful name because the internet is a network of networks. That is why it's called the internet. It's an interconnection of networks. And that is very important because that makes a big difference in terms of what you can do on the internet. We can see that very easily, actually. For example, look, let's look at the phone, right? When I have a phone at home, let's say it's on my phone network, then it is in a specific network. It's in a network operated by the phone company, typically using a technology like 4G or 5G, whatever it is, but it's, it's a specific phone network. On the other hand, I may have something at home like this tablet. And this tablet is also internet connected, but it's connected to a very different network. It's connected to my wireless at home, which is connected to my, in that case, my telephone company at home. So my landline company, so to speak. So very different networks, but still both devices are internet connected and I can use them in the same way. And that is the magic of the internet, the ability to connect devices across underlying network technologies. In order to make this work, you need a unifying layer that can do this, that allows devices to communicate even though they may be on the phone network or they may be on the home wireless network or they may be in a corporate wireless network or a corporate network that uses cables, right? So, so all of these are very different technologies, but you can still use all devices on these networks as internet devices. And the main building block that makes that happen is unsurprisingly called the internet protocol. The internet protocol establishes something that are device addresses that are globally unique that allows devices to communicate on the internet, meaning that each device then has an internet address and I can make connections across individual subnetworks, so to speak. And that is what really establishes this idea of the internet as this overarching way of how devices can communicate. The internet protocol establishes this addressing and then also has mechanisms inside of it to allow routing of data packets between those devices. So that in the end, one device that knows the address of the other device can just send a data packet and the internet will make sure that the data actually gets delivered to the receiver. And the way the internet works is all data gets chopped up into these little packets that are individually delivered to the receiver. This is a connectionless and best effort service, meaning that packets can get dropped, packets may get out of order, packets even sometimes get duplicated. And all of this is something where the internet at that point just says, well, that happens. And it's something where you can therefore see packet loss, duplication, you can see packet corruption. This may sound not great, but it's important to understand that there are many things that the internet protocol does for you. It just doesn't do those things. But one important thing to understand here is that the internet protocol allows devices to communicate. In the end, you don't really want devices to communicate. You want applications to communicate. For example, you want the web browser on your phone to be able to send a request to the web server, which also is an application running on some computer. So you want those two applications to communicate. And making this possible is the job of a transport protocol. So a transport protocol adds application identification and then may also add additional 
improvements, improving on IP's service. Let's look at a simple example first. A simple example of a transport protocol is UDP, the user datagram protocol, and UDP doesn't do much. It adds application information in the form of port numbers. So port numbers, you may have seen those, are these little things that go colon 80 behind a server name or an internet address. And these identify applications. So port 80, for example, by convention is the one port on a device where the web server is accessible. And UDP adds this addressing scheme for applications on devices. And it also adds a checksum mechanism so that you can find out about data packet corruption. But other than that, it doesn't do much. Meaning that UDP allows two applications to communicate, but they still have to deal with packet loss, packets getting out of order, packets possibly getting duplicated and so forth. For most applications, that is not so attractive. And there is a different protocol that you can use on the internet, which is called the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP. And TCP is much more complex than UDP, but also much more powerful. What it does for you is, on the one hand, the same thing that UDP does. It adds address information for applications in the form of port numbers but it also does a lot more to improve on IP service, meaning that it adds numbers to individual packets so that it can track whether packets have been lost. Then it triggers the sender to retransmit data packets. It also can detect that packets are out of order because of the numbers, and then it reorders those packets. And it also adds flow control, meaning that senders of data will not overwhelm receivers of data. What all of this does for you is it creates the illusion of a reliable connection on the internet. It is really a, an illusion because underneath the covers on the IP level, there is no connection. There are still just packets being passed around and some of these packets may get lost or they may get duplicated. But TCP then makes sure that all of this gets cleaned up and in the end all the packets are presented at the receiving end as they were sent. They are put together again and you get this idea of a connection even though underneath the covers everything went very differently. Now, this is very valuable but one thing that TCP doesn't do, and that's the last thing that we will discuss today, is encryption. And when you think of, for example, transmitting your credit card number to a web server, then you want this to be secure. You want this to be encrypted. And this is something where the internet also has standard building blocks for applications to use. For the security part, this is called TLS SSL. SSL is actually the old name. We won't use that name. Um, after this little intro, it's the secure sockets layer. So that was what was it called originally when Netscape actually invented it. Then it was standardized and it was renamed to transport layer security. So I'll just talk about transport layer security from now on. But both names are kind of still being used very often. TLS does two things. It adds server certificates, meaning that a server has to present a certificate and you can think of it as if I connect to Google.com, Google.com has to present a certificate to me saying, hey, I'm really Google. And the idea is that this should prevent another server from switching in and presenting themselves as Google, even though they're not. Because if I'm about to transmit my credit card number, then I want to be sure that I talk to who I think I'm talking to. These certificates are issued by certification authorities. And I'm pretty sure all of you have seen those in action because every now and then when you are surfing the web, suddenly your browser shows some, some warning page and says, for example, something like the certificate of this site has expired. Are you sure you want to connect to it? Right? And that is what happens when, for example, the owners of that site forget to renew their certificate. These have a certain expiration date. And then your browser will actually see that, yeah, maybe there's a certificate, but it's not valid anymore and it will show a warning. So this is something that is important because it allows you to better 
check whether you really want to connect to a site. And then what TLS also does is to encrypt traffic. So after you have established that you connect to the right site, now you can also be sure that anything that gets transmitted actually gets encrypted along the way. And that is important because once again, right, once you are transmitting your credit card number, you don't want this to be transmitted in clear text. You want all of this to be transmitted in a secure manner. And that was it. We've looked at the most important building blocks of the internet. We looked at IP as the foundational layer that establishes the internet in itself because it allows devices to communicate. We looked at UDP as a simple example of a transport protocol that doesn't do much, but it just adds the ability to identify applications. And then we looked at TCP, which is much more complex and much more powerful. And it gives you this idea of having connections on the internet which is what most applications are doing or using nowadays. And then we also looked at TLS, SSL as an additional building block you can also throw in there if you want to have secure communications. Now all of these building blocks then eventually get used by applications. Typical applications are mail transfer protocols. There we have the simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, and the Internet Message Access Protocol, IMAP, SMTP often is used to send email. IMAP often is used to receive email from a server hosting your folders. We also have the File Transfer Protocol. I'm sure a lot of you have used that. And of course, we have the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which all of us are using all the time because that is the protocol underlying the web. And it's also the protocol underlying most APIs today, actually. And with this, we're done. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. This was Getting APIs to Work. I hope I'll see you on the next show. Until then, I hope you're doing well. See you soon. Bye-bye.